أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يقه قولي ربنا زدنا علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين الله أمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome all of you to our Ramadan series 2024 and today we'll be covering just number 23 so let's begin um, in terms of re recap last time we discussed about Surah Fatir uh, Surah Fatir is also known as Surah Malaika, and the key theme of Surah Fatir is Tawheed. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is the creator of everything, whether he is the creator of Malaika, amongst whom is Angel Jibreel, who is blessed with having 600 wings, and on the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator, creator of you and me who do not possess any flying power. So he is the creator of everything. So we must submit to him. Just a overview of this juz. This juz is going to consist of Surah Yasin, Surah Safad, Surah Sad, and Surah Zumar. And all of them, subhanAllah, are Makki surahs. So they're going to have a similar theme to each other. So let's begin. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yaseen wal Quran al-Hakim. Inna kalamin al-Mursalin. Ala sirat al-Mustaqim. Tanzil al-Aziz al-Rahim. Yaseen, by the wise Quran, you are one of the messengers on a straight path. The revelation of the Almighty, the Merciful. So in terms of the virtues of Surah Yasin, we come to know that Abu Darda radiallahu an narrated that whoever recites Surah Yasin close to a dying person, then his death will be an easy one. Why is that so? Because it consists of reminders about the afterlife. So the surah basically takes its name from the two letters of the alphabet with which it begins. The surah was revealed during the second stage of Makki life before the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina. And subhanAllah, when we look at the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off this surah with a dynamic beginning, meaning he swears by the Quran. And any time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by something, it's basically to denote its importance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, by this noble Quran, you, O Prophet Muhammad, you are definitely a messenger, meaning there is no doubt about it. So moving on to ayah number 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about resurrection. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will revive us again once we are resurrected. Then our book of deeds will be presented to us. So far, we have learned that our good deeds and our evil deeds are recorded in this book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even the athar are recorded. The word athar means traces or effects, or what is left behind. Meaning, it doesn't really refer to the good deeds that we actually do. It refers to the impact of our good or evil deeds that shall remain in the physical world or in the hearts of people, even long after the person's death. So say, for instance, if you walk to the masjid, these footsteps are written for you. But if your action initiated your friend to come to the masjid, this is an example of athar. So that's recorded too. Or say, for instance, if you are in the masjid and you felt really emotional listening to an ayah of Quran, so you wept. Tears start rolling down your cheeks. Now, this is your personal amal. This is your personal deed. These tears and this action will be written down in your book of deeds. But say, for instance, unintentionally, if your tears move the person to do a good deed, and subhanAllah, say, for instance, looking at you crying in Salatul Witr uh, in the masjid while the imam was reciting dua, say, for instance, by looking at you, someone else start crying too, or someone else feel moved in the dua as well, then these are the athar. These are the after effects. These are the impacts that are created on the hearts of other people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verily, these traces are documented. They are written down. So subhanAllah, it serves as a glad tiding for us as well as a caution because 
it's not just the good deeds that are being recorded. It's also the after effects that are being recorded for each and every one of us. So the question is, what else fall into the category of athar? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned to us, the best of what a man leaves behind are three. A righteous child who supplicates for him. So let us dissect this. So option one speaks about waladun salih. What does it mean? It means a child who is righteous. Now this in and itself is a jackpot for you. If you manage to raise up a righteous child, each time he or she does something, any good deed, a portion of reward is given to you because you help nurture that child. Also, each time he or she makes dua for you, you will receive it as gifts of joy in your grave, as bonus hasanat. So that's one thing. What else did the Prophet also mention to us? Ongoing charity, the reward of which reaches him, meaning that when we're blessed with wealth, we should pursue for projects that will reap benefits after our death. So say, for instance, investing money in welfare projects, whether it's a hospital or a school, domestic shelter, mosque, or helping the needy, or perhaps donating to construct um, homeless shelters for Muslim men, Muslim women, SubhanAllah, all these are beneficial projects and these are leaving behind athar because after I die, whoever benefits from such a school, such a hospital, such a domestic shelter, then all that is going to be, SubhanAllah, beneficial for the people and it's going to give me a portion of reward as well. And knowledge that is acted upon after him, meaning teaching beneficial knowledge. So say, for instance, you can teach someone the recitation of Quran. So this is a sadaqa jariya for you. But subhanAllah, you may feel that your tajweed isn't good. Then what do you do? You can ask them to memorize the word to a translation of Quran and you can revise with them one lesson per week or per day, even if it means two lines per week. At least they will have something to start with, right? So whether I am good in tajweed or whether I'm good in grammar of this tafsir, anything, whatever I can do. SubhanAllah, if I can dedicate some part of my life, some part of my day to teach others, whether they're my own children or the children of my community, it's going to be a jackpot of rewards for us. Because each time that child, that student read the Quran and understand a word, a reward will be deposited in your account. SubhanAllah. Even if you're dead and long gone, you can still receive bonus salary. Wouldn't that be amazing? So despite the fact whether you are a youth or an adult, male or female, remember that you have much to offer to this world. So do not undermine your talent. And just like we are keen on leaving good at that, subhanAllah, we need to be careful against leaving negative at that as well such that we have to make sure that we do not do anything that's evil and it's harming others after I die because that is going to keep giving me bad deeds, evil deeds. What's the evidence of it? The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that every single murder that takes place on the face of the earth, a portion of that evil deed is given to Qabil, the son of Adam. Why? Because he was the first to start the crime of murder in this world. So this is something very scary. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us against harms. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us that we're able to leave a positive legacy behind us when we pass away.
So moving on to the next passage, I number 13 to 21, a parable is given to us about a nation that was destroyed. So this was before the time of Musa alayhi salam. Many scholars are of the opinion that this town was known as Antakya and the people of this nation used to worship idols. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent three prophets to them. However, this nation persisted on sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, out of the entire nation, there was only one person who believed in the message of the prophets. Just one. Imagine, three prophets sent to the same people, yet what's the outcome of it? Just one person accepts Islam. So this person is the one who's being highlighted over here, that he kept inviting his people towards monotheism. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu an says that his name was Habib al Najjar and he was affected, he was afflicted with leprosy. He was a very charitable man, but the people killed him. The people stoned him to death. The people stomped on him and killed him. So because his intention was very sincere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that. He came running, yes, ah, from the farthest part of the city, calling out to his people that all oh my people follow the messengers, follow them who ask you of no recompense because they are the ones who are guided. So he had a very pure intention that his people can enter Jannah. So what happened? When he presented the message of Islam to them and the people killed him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, enter Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entered him into Jannah the moment his people killed him. And then when he saw what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for him from the pleasures of Jannah, from the amenities of Jannah, instead of getting hypnotized by looking at the waterfalls of Jannah, or instead of getting nuts looking at his beautiful, gorgeous spouse in Jannah, what does this person say? He says, I wish that my people knew that my Lord has forgiven me and placed me amongst the honored ones. SubhanAllah. He still wished hidayah for his people. He still wanted khayr for them. And this is the sincerity of the heart. SubhanAllah. Let's check ourselves and ask ourselves, do I have such a sincere heart such that my heart is always longing for the khayr and betterment of my community? Do I wish for my children to receive hidayah, for their children to receive hidayah? And for that, do I just wish or do I even make some actual efforts such that they can receive hidayah, such that they can come closer to the Qur'an, such that their hearts are attached to the masjid. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us sincere hearts so that when we die, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give us this glad heading as well to enter Jannah. So next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to us a snapshot of the creation because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to ponder over the creation, contemplate over his creation that the sun and the moon, everyone has their assigned duties, whether it's the planets, the stars, all bodies in space, the galaxies that are moving, everything is moving in its perfect orbit. Everything is floating in an exact orbit. And subhanAllah, if you look at the last part of this ayah, observe it. This is the linguistic miracle of the Quran. That the word kaf lam fa, it basically is flipped to become fa lam kaf. And both these words revolve around the letter ya. So the very next word begins with the letter ya. And what does yasbahun literally means? It means to float. So just like these letters are floating around the letter ya, that's how 
the translation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says every single thing is floating in an orbit. Subhanallah. Who can document such a perfect script except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's why no matter how many translations we go through, Quran is a recital whose beauty can only be appreciated in Arabic. Quran is that script, that kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whose beauty can truly be appreciated in Arabic only. So even if we can dedicate few hours per week, few moments per day in order to understand this deep eloquent language we should definitely invest our time for it so next passage allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to us the scene of the day of judgment allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the trumpet will be blown then behold they will rush from the tombs to their lord and they will say woe to us who resurrected us from our resting place. This is what the most gracious had promised. And the messengers have spoken the truth. So just like all these bodies in space are rotating around one object, the sun, our center of life should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too, whom we should be rotating around 24-7. So that's the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to us the scene of the day of judgment because when the trumpet is blown we're gonna wake up in a state of shock and we're gonna rush to our center who is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so immediately as the trumpet is blown we're gonna wake up from our graves and we're gonna say who woke us up from our slumber and marqad refers to a short nap so the analogy given over here is that we're not going to realize how much time has passed that's how much hasty we're going to be in order to rush towards our lord allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and subhanallah if you think about it it's something really scary because all these things that we're discussing right now whether it's the grave the day of judgment all this is going to be actualized into reality the moment we die. So meaning what? If the very minute, the very second, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to take my ruh, then all this that we're talking about right now, it's going to come into action. It's going to become reality for me. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant all of us an easy reckoning. Ayah number 59 to 63, a very painful ayah indeed, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sketches the scene of the day of judgment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to the people, أَلَمْ أَعْهَدْ إِلَيْكُمْ يَا بَنِي آدَمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدُوا أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا وَالشَّيَاطِينَ وَالشَّيَاطِينَ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to say, did I not tell you, O children of Adam, that you shall not serve the devil, that he is your sworn enemy? Wam tazul yawma literally comes from the word imtiyaz. And imtiyaz literally means when something is mixed together and it's asked to be separated. That's what is going to happen on the day of Qiyamah. Meaning in this world, we're all living together. We should socialize with each other. We talk to each other. We live happily ever after. But then on the day of resurrection, we're going to be separated. We're not going to be together. And subhanAllah, the word used over here is, وَامْتَازُ الْيَوْمَ أَيُّهَا الْمُجْرِمُونَ It's not أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ It's not أَيُّهَا الْفَاسِقُونَ it's mujrimun, and mujrimun comes from jurm, meaning criminals. So basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to the criminals, Oh criminals, step aside. Even though you used to hang with these people in dunya, even though you used to socialize with such scholars in this dunya, but right now, you're not entering Jannah. Right now, you're going to doom in hellfire. Imagine how painful that's going to be. 
Imagine how much agony that would give to us. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from such an evil ending. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us in righteous company in this world and to resurrect us amongst the righteous in on the day of Qiyamah. I mean, so mommy. So I number 65, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about an unfathomable testimony where our limbs, our hands, our mouth, our feet are going to testify to everything that we have done in this world. So how is that going to happen? Subhanallah, in fayakun. With the idhan of Allah, our limbs are going to either testify for us or against us. So similar to a Fitbit, but technologically more advanced and powerful are the records of the angels, where each and every footstep of ours is recorded. Whether it was for a positive cause or a negative cause, every movement is recorded. So our own body parts will testify for us or against us. If we're sinful, our mouths will be sealed. We will ask them, Oh my limbs, stop. Do not testify against me. But no matter how hard we try, no matter how much efforts we put in, our limbs are going to speak with the idhan of Allah. So that is going to be a kind of testimony that we cannot ignore. We cannot stop. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our testimonies on our behalf and not against us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help all of us. Ameen. So moving on to ayah number 69 to 70. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us that indeed this Quran is a reminder to warn the living and to confirm the sentence against the unbelievers. And subhanAllah, this surah, if you look at it, this surah is often recited at the death of someone. Meaning when someone passes away, everyone gathers together and recites surat Yaseen. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us here? And it's fascinating how this ayah is part of this surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us in this very surah that the Qur'an is for the living. The purpose of Qur'an is to warn us. The purpose of the Qur'an is to guide us. Had Qur'an just been for the dead, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wouldn't have to cry for Abu Talib. He wouldn't have to beg Allah to forgive him. He could have just recited loads of Surat Yaseen, loads of Quran on behalf of Abu Talib, and everything would have been just fine. But why was he upset? Because he died as a mushrik. Why was the Prophet upset? Because he didn't accept or follow the Quran. So this Quran has come down for us to attain Hidayah. For us to be guided. And we cannot attain guidance if we do not read this book. If we do not understand this book. So let's not wait to recite the Quran only in funerals. Let's open this book right now and start studying it seriously. Because this is our manual for guidance. Moving on to the last passage of this surah, another power-charged conclusion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, everything belongs to him. Meaning our wealth, our families, our real estate, everything will one day return to him. So let's prepare for a final journey before it's too late. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a blessed ending. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our hisab easy. Allahumma hasibni hisaban yaseera. So from the lens of Surah Yaseen, I have created this chart for us. How to leave a positive legacy behind. So in terms of knowledge, we can try to teach beneficial knowledge to others. Even it's like Islamic knowledge or secular knowledge. As long as it's beneficial for others and as long as it's following the criteria of the Quran and Sunnah, then Alhamdulillah, there's nothing wrong in it. 
In terms of knowledge, we can also teach someone a valuable skill, nurture the love of Allah and his prophet among the students, help a new Muslim learn Islam, or subhanAllah, if we think we're not that knowledgeable enough and I cannot really share anything with others because I do not have confidence or I lack in terms of my self-esteem, self-confidence, then perhaps I can use my wealth. How do I do that? So I can sponsor a student. I can construct a, a well. I can participate in the construction of the masjid or at least donate towards it or any masjid projects that are being done in our masajid. We can donate towards it or subhanAllah, we can donate religious material, keep the Quran in the masjid when we go for Umrah or Hajj or in our local masajids or help in construction, constructing homeless shelters that can help serve the community. So the opportunities are endless. And subhanAllah, if I do not possess that much wealth and I have limited amount of wealth, then we can try to raise our children whose hearts are attached to the masjid, who can frequent the masjid. We should nurture in our children the love of Allah and our Prophet. We should raise children who can make dua for us, who can supplicate for us. And imagine if a person is able to use all these vouchers, all these perks, then imagine the hasanat he's able to accumulate. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're able to use our knowledge, our wealth, and our children, fi sabilillah, so that when we pass away, we're able to leave a positive legacy behind us. Allahumma ameen. So with that said, we begin Surah Safat. Surah Safat is also a Makki surah. And this surah takes its name from the word Saf. And what does Saf mean? Saf means those who rank themselves in order, ranged in roles. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the surah by saying, Wasafati Safa, by the aligners who align, and the drivers driving, and the reciters of the reminder. Your Lord is indeed one, Lord of the heavens and the earth, and everything between them, and Lord of the Easts. So basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us the malaika who stand in perfect rows hastening to receive the command of Allah and carry it out. And the roles of malaika, the roles, the alignment of the angels in the sight of Allah is the perfect alignment. And why is this mentioned to us? So that we can learn a lesson from them. So how do we apply this in our lives? Anytime we go to the masjid for congregational salah, we try to maintain our saf. The Prophet wasallam said, establish the rows for prayer, stand shoulder to shoulder, close the gaps, accommodate your brethren, and do not leave any breaches for shaitan. Whoever connects a row, Allah will connect with him. Whoever breaks a row, Allah will break for him. So this is something very important to note that when we pray congregational salah, there are certain rulings, there is a criteria to it, and we should perform our salah according to that criteria. So what do we do? Meaning many a times we do attend salat al Jum'ah or salat al Tarawih. What do I do when I go to the masjid? First of all, we should recite the dua of masjid when we enter. Second of all, we should try our best that we do not offend our fellow companions. So say, for instance, if I'm late for the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ recommended us to still go and catch salah in a calm manner. We shouldn't run. We should put our shoes in the shoe shelf and then keep the place neat and uh, clean and tidy and then make sure that we do not offend our fellow companions in any way, shape, or form. So say, for instance, if we just cooked food at home, then it's preferred to change something else and go to the masjid so that we do not smell like ginger and garlic. 
And again, subhanAllah, when we actually stand in salah and we join our Muslim sisters in salah, we have to make sure that there are no gaps in between. We have to stand shoulder to shoulder. We have to fill in the gaps. And when we are in congregation, a haqq of congregation is that we should follow the imam. We cannot precede him while doing ruku or sujood and we cannot go ahead of him. So this is something important to note that when we pray congregational salah, it gives us 27 times more reward as is mentioned by the Prophet wasallam. but it has some criteria to follow. It has some guidelines to follow and we should try our best to do that in order to read the best of rewards. I number 25 till 31 sketches a scene from the day of judgment for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically presents to us a scene when people are going to be in a state of chaos. They're going to be standing next to each other, meaning they are going to be having a saf, but they're going to be in a state of chaos. They're going to be blaming each other. For instance, a wife is going to be blaming her husband who peer pressurized her to commit haram. Or a husband is going to be complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because his wife forced him to seek haram income. A person who usurped the property of an orphan or an orphan who took advantage of his caretakers and abused them is going to be blaming the other person so every person will be blaming someone else who forced them towards sin and how will justice be established in this chaos it is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is going to establish justice and that's why this is something only allah can do because we humans are so weak that even if we try to judge we may end up making mistakes. Even if we try our best, we may end up siding with the criminal instead of siding with the oppressed. So ultimate justice on the day of judgment can only be established by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from committing wrong in this world so that we do not have to end up giving our hasanat to the ones whom we have oppressed. So next ayah, ayah 50 to 57, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents a scene to us about a person who entered Jannah and as he is sitting, reclining and resting, he remembers something from dunya. He's like, oh my God, I had a friend in dunya who used to deny the day of resurrection. I wonder where is he now? And then a voice will call out and ask him to look down. And as he looks down, he sees his friend in the pit of hellfire. That's when he's going to say, Alhamdulillah, I did not listen to him. Otherwise, I would have been ruined. So he is going to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's how much peer pressure there was in dunya. Had he chosen to be his friend for the rest of his life, perhaps maybe he would have ended up in a state of being deviated from Islam. So different phases of life, subhanAllah, we are surrounded by people, different kinds of people. There could be some who insert doubts in our mind regarding resurrection. There could be others who insert doubts regarding Jannah and Nar, regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is dunya. This is a place of test. And on a daily basis, we meet different kinds of people. There could be a person who can lead us to Jannah, and there could be a person who can lead us to Jahannam. So let's be very careful in terms of who we befriend, because it can have very evil consequences to it if we fail to choose a good friend. So the whispers are always going to be there. We can never get, get rid of them. 
But if we happen to ward off these evil whispers, then, inshallah, it's going to be clear for us in the long run. We will protect ourselves from being doomed forever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from an evil ending. So from ayah 58 to 61, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the eternal bliss in Jannah, that for those who ward off the evil thoughts of shaitan, for those who protect themselves against evil friendships and the peer pressure they offer, then for them is going to be eternal bliss in Jannah. And that is going to be the supreme triumph. But for those who fail to ignore the evil whispers of shaitan who listen to their desires and make their desires as ira as god and blind follow those desires then for them is going to be the awful tree in jahannam what is this tree it is zakum and this tree, as mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a tree that emerges from the bottom of Jahannam, meaning that it is something very painful for the inhabitants of Jahannam to eat and consume. This tree has fruits as if they were heads of a devil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even though the taste is so bad, and even though the food of Jahannam will be given with a mixture of scalding water, yet the inhabitants of Jahannam will fill their bellies with it, consuming the fruit of this tree and drinking hot water because they don't have any other option. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from Jahannam and protect us from all the food and drinks of Jahannam and grant us a peaceful abode in Jannah. Next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions different stories to us. The story of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam is highlighted for us and then Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. But because we have already covered the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam in detail, I'm going to just mention a dua that he did, which is very vital for us. He made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Rabbi habli min as Oh my Lord, bless me with a righteous child. And it's mentioned that Ibrahim alayhi salam did not have any children till 86 years. So when he was 86 years old, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did hiba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted him with a righteous son, Ismail alayhi salam, as a response to this dua. So if we want our du'as to be accepted, then let's make du'a from the words of the Prophet, choosing the words of the Prophets. Next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala applauds two exemplary brothers, Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates them by saying salamun ala Musa wa Harun. Peace is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon these great prophets. Meaning, they are special people for us. They are our role models. Now, when we come to Harun alayhi salam, subhanAllah, Harun alayhi salam is a prophet who's often underrated by us. Why? Because he's mostly mentioned in tandem with his brother Musa alayhi salam. So let's not forget that his name is mentioned about 20 times in the Quran. And of course, that teaches us that he's someone very important. So the question is, who is Harun? Harun alayhi salam was from the tribe of Levi, son of Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam. And he was a year older than Prophet Moses. And he was born during the year when baby boys were not being killed. Because we said it was alternate years when the baby boys were killed. So Harun alayhi salam basically remained with his mother. And he wasn't thrown in River Nile like his brother. So his life wasn't endangered. What was the path of prophethood for him? It was due to the dua of his brother, Musa alayhi salam. Because Musa alayhi salam made dua to Allah by saying, Azri ahli. Basically, azr is like a back brace. And why do we wear a back brace? In order to give support to our back. So when we aren't able to hold something, our back is unable to hold on to it, that's azr. The back support that we wear 
in order to be comfortable, that's us. So basically, Musa alayhi salam is asking dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make Harun his back brace, his strong supporter. Now, when we look at Musa and Harun, Musa alayhi salam was a strong built man, tall, heavy stature. Then why did he need the help of Harun alayhi salam? That's something to think about. Because Harun alayhi salam was eloquent in his speech. So because of the strength of his speech, Harun alayhi salam was chosen to assist Musa alayhi salam in prophethood. Why? Because Musa alayhi salam, even though he was very strong in terms of his physical structure and he carried out all the miracles, but he had a speech impediment. So we see over here that both brothers were given different talents. Harun alayhi salam wasn't really given any miracles by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet, he was eloquent in his speech. He was able to teach Torah to the Israelites in a very eloquent manner. So this story teaches us to embrace our talents because each one of us are gifted with different abilities. Rather than being jealous over it, we should use our abilities for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Musa alayhi salam returned after 40 days from Mount Sinai after receiving the Torah, he noticed the Bani Israel have started worshipping the calf. Something, if you notice, the Israelites wanted to do from day one. Remember, after they crossed the Red Sea, they kept requesting Musa alayhi salam if they can craft an idol in the shape of a calf and worship it. So subhanAllah, that's something so embedded in their hearts. So once Musa alayhi salam left to receive the Torah, they fulfilled their wish. They were able to dominate over Harun alayhi salam and they started worshipping a calf. They fell into shirk. And of course, when Musa alayhi salam came from Mount Sinai, he was enraged. He was enraged at Harun and he seized him by his beard. The, how dare you allow this to happen? How could you let it pass? But Harun alayhi salam then gave his explanation to Musa alayhi salam that, oh my brother, I wanted to protect the Israelites from division. That's the reason why I stayed quiet. So we see that Harun alayhi salam had wisdom in him. Harun alayhi salam was a very soft-hearted person. So he dealt with compassion. And that's when Musa alayhi salam realized that it wasn't the fault of Harun alayhi salam. So he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive both of them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them both. So subhanAllah, in this is an example of great brotherhood for us. And in terms of Harun alayhi salam, we come to know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave this glad tiding to Saad ibn Waqqas radiallahu an that you are in the same position with me as Harun was in relation to Musa. But the only explicit difference is that there is no prophet after me. Meaning that's how closely Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appointed Saad radiallahu an to be in such close stature. And of course, we know that Saad ibn Waqas radiallahu an is one of the Ashra Mubashirin. He's one of the 10 companions who were given the glad tidings of Jannah in this dunya. So this is a mode of honor for Saad radiallahu an, how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressed him. And that's how he was very close to Saad radiallahu an. Anyways, so there are multiple instances in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, mentions the story of Prophet Musa and Harun to us. In terms of the prophetic hadith, we come to know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met Prophet Harun alayhi salam in the fifth heaven. So when he went on the journey of Isra wal Mi'raj, he met Prophet Harun on the fifth heaven where they exchanged salam, where they exchanged greeting. 
So a question that often pops up is that when we cover the story of Maryam alayhi salam, we do come to know in the Quran that when Maryam alayhi salam carries Isa alayhi salam, the people accuse her, her people, her nation accuse her by saying, O oh, Harun, O oh, sister of Harun, how could you commit such a crime? So the question is, is Maryam alayhi salam the biological sister of Prophet Harun alayhi salam? And the answer is no. She was from the descendants of Harun alayhi salam, and that's what they were attributing to. So this is something to clarify in our mind that whenever we come across this ayah, we need to know that Maryam alayhi salam was not the sister of Harun alayhi salam, rather a descendant of Harun alayhi salam. And subhanAllah, in terms of um, life, Harun alayhi salam lived up to 122 years. That's when he passed away. A um, few years before Musa alayhi salam, when the Israelites were wandering in the desert for 40 years. He wasn't able to enter the promised land. He wasn't able to enter Palestine. And he passed away before that dream was fulfilled. So that was a little bit about Prophet Harun alayhi salam. Moving on to the next passage of this surah, ayah 123 to 132. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned to us about Prophet Ilyas. And again, this is a prophet that we know very little about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he is from amongst the messengers. So the question is, who is he? And for that, we need to know about his legacy. Prophet Ilyas alayhi salam, also known as Ilyasin in the Quran, is known as Elijah in Bible. And he was from the descendants of Prophet Harun alayhi salam. And his name is mentioned twice in the Quran. So if you go back to the story of Prophet Suleiman alayhi salam, we mentioned that after Suleiman alayhi salam passed away, he divided his kingdom amongst his two sons. And his kingdom was divided into two empires, the northern and the southern. So the northern empire was able to maintain its stability because it included Quds, it included Jerusalem. So there were a lot of scholars over there. So the scholars guided the people and they recited the Torah in Masjid al-Aqsa. So they were fine. Whereas the southern empire was deprived of scholars. So they started to move away from the Sharia of Musa alayhi salam. And eventually, idolatry started to spread amongst the children of Israel. And the name of the idol that the people of this southern empire worshipped, the name of the idol was Baal. It was an idol made of gold and had four faces. The place where the idol was located was called Balabik, and that's basically a place in Damascus um, today. So we do know this place. So this was the timeline when Prophet Elias was sent to these people to oppose idol worship. He was born about nine centuries before Isa alayhi salam. So he invited his people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without associating any partners with him. But what happened? His people did not listen to him. And they deported him from the city. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed abundance from them. They did not have any rain. Animals started to die. And they were hit by many misfortunes. That's when they realized that the reason behind all this suffering is because they denied their messenger. So they apologized to him, they repented to Allah, and they became believers. And after this, um, he was directed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make al yasa to be his successor. And inshallah, we're going to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention to us about Prophet al yasa as well. Again, not much detail is known about him, but keep this name in mind because we are going to bring it up um, during this class. So that's all about Prophet Ilyas. There is unfortunately not much mentioned about him in the Quran and Sunnah, but 
as we know, he was a great prophet of Allah and he is honored in the Quran. Peace and blessings be upon him. So that brings us to the conclusion of this surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes this surah by saying, Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun huwa salamun ala al-mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Meaning all the messengers that we spoke about, whether it's Prophet Musa alayhi salam, who was one of the Ulul Azam prophets, or whether it was Prophet Elias alayhi salam, about whom we don't even know much. Peace be upon all the messengers. We accept all the messengers. As Muslims, we do not reject any of the prophets that were sent to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we praise them, we honor them, and we follow them, inshallah. And because all these messengers are sent to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All thanks to Allah, who is the Lord of the worlds. So some of the action points from Surah Safat, again, lots of things to learn, but subhanAllah, since Surah Safat is a Makki Surah, the main theme of all the Makki Surahs are same, which is about Tawheed, trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not going into despair, and doing things that pleases Allah, and protecting ourselves against the whispers of shaitan. So moving on to the next surah, we have Surat Saad. Surat Saad is also a Makki surah. And in terms of this surah, just a word of caution that this surah has a lot of mutashabihat. Okay? So in terms of just number three, when we were covering Surat Al-Imran, we mentioned that Quran has ayat that are muhkamat. And mutashabihat, muhkamat are clear ayat, meaning any one of us can just hold an ashaf, start reciting the Quran, and it's very easy for us to understand. But amongst the mutashabihat, there are stories whose extensive detail isn't mentioned to us in the Quran and Sunnah. These are mutashabihat. And this surah, Surah Sa'ad, has a lot of mutashabihat surahs in it. So meaning, Regarding these stories, we do not get much detail from the Quran and Sunnah, so multiple interpretations have been given by the scholars in this regard. So we have to understand these surahs with the right context and protect ourselves from attributing any kind of blasphemy to the prophets. So, um, with that said, let's begin the surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Saad wal Qur'ani di dhikr. Saad, again, the translation of it is not known to anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the renowned Qur'an. So, this surah begins with the letter Saad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically taking an oath by the Qur'an to say that these disbelievers of Makkah are suffering from the disease of pride. And subhanAllah, when we look at the people of Makkah at that time and the Quran was being revealed to the Prophet wasallam, the irony was that the disbelievers of Makkah would often challenge the Prophet. So they would hold on to the cloth of Kaaba and make dua against themselves. And they would say, Ya Allah, hasten your punishment on us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates to them about the previous nations. That look at the nation of Nuh, Ad, Fir'aun, Thamud. Look at the people of Lut. Look at the nation of Shu'aib. Look at their evil fate when they rejected their prophet. Look at them. Ponder over their stories and take heed. Correct yourself. So this surah is going to present different story snapshots to us from the lives of the prophets. So let's go ahead and begin this surah. So the first passage, ayah 21 till 25. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to stay firm, be patient, and take example from Da'ud alayhi salam. And a particular snapshot is mentioned to us the time when Da'ud alayhi salam was tested. What was this 
seen what actually happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to us that there was a time when Da'ud alayhi salam was sitting in his mihrab worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he saw two people climbing into his house. And they start presenting a case to him because, of course, he was a king, he was a judge. So the people would come to him in order to seek judgment. So these two men, they requested him to make an um, unbiased decision. So person A, he said that my brother owns 99 goats and he's trying to take ownership of my one goat. Is this fair? And the way he presented his sob story, Da'ud salam immediately ruled the case in his favor. That yes, you are right. If he already has 99 goats, why should he seize your one goat? That's, that's wrong. And subhanAllah, he passed a judgment without listening to the opponent. That's when it clicked to him that these two men are not real men. They are in fact... Angels disguised as men in order to test me. So as soon as the men disappeared out of his sight, he realized that he has made a mistake. So he immediately bowed down to Allah and made tawbah. He repented to Allah. And this is something that happens to all of us. Many a times we also become... SubhanAllah, part of a case where someone comes to us to resolve an issue, whether it's in case of sibling rivalry or a marital discord, it happens that we don't listen to both sides of the story. And we rule in favor of our beloved daughter or our beloved son or friend. We take sides based upon a biased decision. Many a time when a marital relationship is on the verge of divorce, again, we don't even hear both the parties, what they have to offer. But because so-and-so is my friend, we just side with her. Even though we know that she's the oppressor in the marriage and not the oppressed, still, because I'm related to her, because she's my best friend, I pass my judgment in her favor. So this story teaches us the burden of responsibility on a ruler, on a judge. Regardless of the fact, whatever position we hold in a given society, whether you are a mother or a mother-in-law, whether you are a daughter or a daughter-in-law, whether you are an employer or an employee, we come across circumstances where we're expected to pass a judgment. Let's be careful in this regard because that one decision of ours can create a huge impact on the life of others. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide all of us. Another lesson we learn from this story is the importance of seeking repentance. As soon as Dawud alayhi salam realized his mistake, he immediately fell on his knees and repented. And this is a golden rule that we must apply in ourselves, in our lives. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned, there is no one who commits a sin, then he purifies himself well, meaning he does wudu, and he stands and prays two rakah, and then asks Allah for forgiveness, but Allah will forgive him. So, subhanAllah, this is the dalil for Salatul Tawbah, that if we are guilty for committing a crime, for committing a sin, it's never too late to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's immediately bow down to Allah, prostrate to Him, cry and weep in front of Him, and ask sincere Tawbah. And we hope, inshallah, Allah will forgive us. So next we come across another story, a snapshot from the life of the son of Dawud alayhi salam, who is he? Prophet Suleiman alayhi salam. This segment of the story of Suleiman alayhi salam, by the way, is not mentioned anywhere else in the Quran. So over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to us a scene when Suleiman alayhi salam was caressing his horses. The mighty stallions, beautiful black and white horses. He kept caressing them 
to the point that the sun started to go down. And he didn't realize that he almost missed his Asr Salah. So he became extremely remorseful for this mistake. He repented to Allah and he said, Ya Allah, I have preferred the niceties of this world to your remembrance. And as a result of this guilt, I release all my horses. I free them out of their shackles. So, meaning what? That the horses that were shackled were released as a mode of kafara for his sin. He set them free as a sacrifice for the sake of Allah. Now, when we come across the explanation, the interpretation of these ayat, some of the interpretations mentioned to us that Suleiman salam became so upset at the horses that they are the ones, in fact, who drifted him away from Salatul Asr, that as a result of his anger, he slaughtered the, house, the horses, all of them, hundreds of them. Now, according to the scholars, this interpretation is not correct because why should the horses suffer because of the mistake that Suleiman salam did? It doesn't make sense, right? SubhanAllah, it doesn't make sense that why would Suleiman hold accountable the horses and punish them even though it was him who missed his Asr Salah? So, the scholars say that this interpretation is coming from the Judeo Christian narrative, so we shouldn't believe this. Rather, what he did was that he thamsahu, he rubbed his hands, he passed his hands over their necks, praising Allah, doing tawbah to Allah, and as a mode of kafara, as an expiation for his sin, he didn't just resort to tawbah, but he released his horses. He freed them for the sake of Allah. So this is something important for us to clarify that this doesn't mean slaughtering. He didn't slaughter his horses. He rather freed them. And this story also has a lesson for us to learn that when we become busy in life, whether it's at work, school, going out shopping, there could be a situation where we get so busy with the world and all it has to offer that we literally miss our salah. So question one is, do I even feel guilty for missing something that's far upon me? The second thing is, once I do feel guilty, do I just make it up? Meaning, do I just pray qada and that's about it? Or do I hold myself accountable for it? Do I penalize myself by disciplining myself? So the question is, how do I discipline myself? So say, for instance, we missed our Salat al because we were busy with our errands. So first thing we do is istighfar. We pray our Salah as soon as we get home. And on top of that, I penalize myself by giving sadaqah, by giving $10, $20. Why? So that I can keep myself on check, that I do not repeat this mistake again. As a mode of disciplining myself, we should give ourselves penalty. And of course, this is not something fart. This is just a recommendation by the scholars. So whether it's giving sadaqah or pay, praying, praying an extra voluntary salah, something has to be there so that we do not repeat this mistake again. And this is the only way we can actually self-discipline ourselves. Anyways, so... This wasn't just the only test for Prophet Suleiman He asked Allah to forgive him and he made dua to Allah. Um, that Ya Allah, forgive me and grant me a kingdom that hasn't been granted to anyone. So subhanAllah, he was forgiven. His supplication was accepted. But what happened next? He was given another test. He was tested again. Prophet Suleiman basically made an intention that he will make all his sons warriors in the path of Allah. 
However, he didn't say insha'Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he placed a jasad, a body on his throne. So the scholars say that Suleiman alayhi salam did have a son. However, because he didn't say insha'Allah, the boy was deformed and he wasn't able to carry out the obligations and duties that are supposed to be carried out by a ruler, by a king. So that's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that Suleiman alayhi salam himself became very weak. He became so sick that he was just like a jasad on his throne, useless to do anything. So this was a test for Suleiman alayhi salam. However, Suleiman alayhi salam repented to Allah and he was forgiven. And from this, we also see the humanity of the prophets that even though they were prophets, yes, they committed mistakes. Yes, it did happen that unintentionally one time he missed his Asr Salah. Yes, unintentionally he forgot to say Insha'Allah. So yes, prophets can make mistakes. It is possible. And the lesson to learn from them is that when we make mistakes, we should follow the prophetic guidelines, which is to hasten to do tawbah, seek istighfar, and try to discipline ourselves such that we do not commit the mistake again. Next, we go on to passage number, uh, next passage, which is ayah 41 to 43. And over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to us the story of Ayyub alayhi salam. And subhanAllah, this is the segment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about Ayyub alayhi salam that test can come in the form of sickness. Plus, tests can come to us in a form of taking care of the sick. So many a times, whenever we talk about the story of Ayyub alayhi salam, it's always the patience of Ayyub that's highlighted. I want to present to you the other side of the story, the flip side of the coin. What is it? The patience of his wife. It's also something that needs to be taken into consideration. Because yes, Ayyub alayhi salam was very patient and he was rewarded for his patience. But what about his wife? Who spent her entire youth taking care of her sick husband? Who wasn't able to enjoy the worldly life because she was taking care of her husband? What is the lesson for us to learn from this? Many a times we... We feel deprived because we're not able to participate in the activities of khair. We're not able to worship like other people are. So say, for instance, when we think about people going to masjid in the month of Ramadan, giving charity, praying salah, reciting so much Quran, and we think to ourselves, wow, how fortunate are these people? How lucky, how blessed are these people that they're able to accumulate so much rewards, and here I am sitting in my home having nothing to do because I'm taking care of my sick parent, or I'm taking care of my sick husband, or my autistic child. What has life given me? Nothing but troubles, nothing but worries. What am I going to have on the day of Qiyamah? I don't have any good deeds. I have nothing to offer to this world. SubhanAllah, these feelings of remorse and guilt, they arise from the whisperings of shaitan. So let's not delve too much into it. Because the Prophet wasallam gave glad tidings to a person who takes care of the sick. The Prophet ﷺ said, when a Muslim visits a sick Muslim at dawn, 70,000 angels keep on praying for him till dusk. If he visits him in the evening, 70,000 angels keep praying for him till the morning, and he will have his share of reaped fruits in Jannah. So imagine, if a person is getting this much reward, that he's reaping the fruits of Jannah till he accompanies a sick person in the morning or the evening and 70,000 angels assist him. If this is the reward just for visiting a sick, imagine if you were living with the sick. Imagine if you were taking care of the sick. How much ajr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you? How much rahmah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have on you? 
that is something very important for us to ponder. So no matter what situation we live in, no matter what circumstances we face, let's be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be patient. Yes, it's not easy. Sometimes it's very overwhelming indeed, but let's hold on to patience just like the wife of Ayyub alayhi salam did because indeed patience bring a lot of rewards. Sabr brings a lot of hasana. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to include us amongst the righteous people, amongst the sabirin. Next in ayah number 48 and 49, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about his righteous prophets. So more names are mentioned to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about Ismail alayhi salam, Yasa alayhi salam, also known as Alisha, and Dhul Kifil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that all of them are amongst the outstanding people, outstanding prophets. So we know Ismail alayhi salam that his trial was that he was set up for sacrifice. This was a hukum given to Ibrahim alayhi salam to sacrifice his son Ismail. And Ismail alayhi salam passed the test by flying colors by obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obeying his father. And as a result of his patience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced Ismail with a ram, and that's why we commemorate him on every Eid al-Adha each time we sacrifice an animal. So this is in turn of his commemoration. So that's about Ismail alayhi salam. What about Yasa alayhi salam? Who is he? So let's talk a little bit about it. Yasa alayhi salam was basically a successor to Prophet Ilyas alayhi salam. He came to guide the children of Israel and he was from the descendants of Yusuf alayhi salam. One of the miracles that were given to Prophet Yasa was the fact that he was able to bring the dead back to life. And he was able to heal the one who was born blind and the leper. And the river Jordan was dried up for him so that he walked across it. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how authentic this narration is. This is the opinion of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. However, this is all what we know about Prophet Yasa alayhi salam or Elisha how is mentioned over here. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about Dhul Kifil, peace be upon him. So who is that? He is known as Izkil. And he was one of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who succeeded Prophet Moses. Some of the historians believe he was the son of Ayyub alayhi salam, whereas some believe that he was the son of Da'ud alayhi salam. However, he became a successor a prophet Yasa. So if you want to put all this into place, we spoke about Ilyas alayhi salam. Ilyas alayhi salam, when he passed away, he appointed Yasa alayhi salam to be his successor. When Yasa alayhi salam passed away, he appointed Dhul Kifil alayhi salam to be his successor. So subhanAllah, Dhul Kifil, it's mentioned that his grave is near the city of Najaf in Iraq, and again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about its authenticity. So that's very little information that we know about these three prophets. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have his peace and blessings upon all of them. So moving on to the next passage, ayah 71 to 83, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us a snapshot from the story of Adam alayhi salam and Iblis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he will fill Jahannam with jinns. Jahannam minka wa tabi'aka minhum ajma'in. I will surely fill Jahannam with you and those of them that follow you all together. Now, we may wonder, how can the fire of hell harm Iblis when he himself is created with fire, right? And the answer is, just like we are made from dust and burying us alive will definitely choke us to death, will definitely suffocate us and kill us, throwing baked clay towards us will definitely hurt us. 
Just like that, the fire of hell will be able to harm Iblis, even though he's created from fire. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect all of us. So as we come to a conclusion of today's session, we want to take some time and discuss the father of mankind, Prophet Adam alayhi salam, and talk about his legacy. So in terms of his legacy, we come to know from Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an, who said that Adam alayhi salam wasn't the first creation. Yes, he was the first human being, but in terms of creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him after the creation of angels and jinns. So basically, the jinns existed 2,000 years before Adam alayhi salam, and they lived on the earth shedding blood. That's the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent on them an army of angels that drove them out to the depths of the sea. And this is the opinion of Ibn Abbas radiallahu an. Another opinion says that the angels were informed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create human beings on earth who will create corruption. And that's the reason why the angels questioned that, Ya Allah, why do you want to create a khalifa on earth who is going to cause corruption? So, in terms of the creation of Adam alayhi salam, Adam alayhi salam was created from a handful of dust taken from different lands. So, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and this hadith is in Bukhari, that the children of Adam have been created according to the composition of the land. Therefore, amongst mankind, there are people with white, red, black, and yellow complexion. There are good and evil amongst them. Some are easygoing and some are not. And some are in between them. Meaning, just like different kinds of dirts have different characteristics, just like that, different skin color people can have different characteristics. And that's the variation that we have in terms of population. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And this is from divine decree. So, this is the creation of Adam alayhi salam. When was he created? Again, we come to know from a prophetic hadith that he was created on Friday. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the best of days on which the sun has risen is Friday. On this day, Adam was created and on this day, he descended to earth. So the question is, when exactly Adam alayhi salam entered Jannah. So we come to know that when the shape of clay was molded into the figure of human being, Adam alayhi salam stayed in that shape for 40 years. And after 40 years, when the ruh was blown into him, he sneezed. And the angel said, recite, alhamdulillah. And that's when Adam alayhi salam said, all praise belongs to Allah. Alhamdulillah. And that's a sunnah we follow till this day today. That when we cease, we are supposed to say Alhamdulillah. Also, when the ruh came to Adam alayhi salam, the first thing he did was that he greeted the angels with salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this will be the greeting of you and your progeny after you. So yes, even though when we meet our Muslim brothers and sisters, we may be tempted to say good morning, good afternoon, hello, but the best greeting that is given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is salam, to say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Because it's not just a greeting, it also carries a dua. Another um, subhanAllah important point to note is that Adam alayhi salam was titled as Ashraf al makhluqat the best of creations. Why is that so? Because he was given the knowledge of everything. So whether it was science, history, psychology, sociology, he was given all knowledge. And that's what made Iblis jealous. That how come Adam is better than me? When he's created from dust, and I'm created of fire. Honestly speaking, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished, he could have annihilated Iblis. 
But it's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that despite the obedience, the disobedience of Iblis, despite his sinful activity and shirk of all human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his mercy, gave Iblis respite. And it is the mercy of Allah that all the people who follow Iblis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them time to repent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't hold them accountable immediately. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them freedom of choice to think wisely and correct themselves. And this is out of the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we may wonder that if the angels are the most subservient creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how come they question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding the creation of Adam? Did they actually question the decree of Allah? And the answer to that is no. They simply questioned out of curiosity. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed Adam alayhi salam to present his knowledge to the angels in order to establish the hujjah that indeed Adam was given knowledge about which the angels are unaware of, the angels posed this question out of curiosity. So what, what the angels said wasn't really a sin on their part. They were not questioning the decree of Allah. And they cannot even do that because they are programmed in such a way that they only obey Allah. Now, how long did Adam salam stay alone in Jannah? The answer is not that long. Because when Adam salam was sent to Jannah, he actually felt very lonely. Because there was no one to speak to. He wanted to socialize. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted him with a partner. Who was she? Hawa alayhi salam. And she is known to be the most beautiful woman on the face of the earth. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, O oh Muslims, I advise you to be gentle with women. For they are created from a rib. And the most crooked portion of the rib is its upper part. If you try to straighten it, it will break. And if you leave it, it will remain crooked. So I urge you to take care of your woman. So basically, Hawa alayhi salam was created from the rib of Adam. And it's an honor for all the women that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam suggests the men to be gentle with their women, whether they are wives, daughters, sisters. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam recommends them to be extra kind, extra compassionate towards women and take utmost care of them. So indeed, Adam alayhi salam was an excellent partner to Hawa alayhi salam and vice versa. So they lived a very happy life in Jannah, and this was phase one, when Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam experienced their dream vacation, which is the aspiration of all the human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted them to enjoy everything except for one tree. So the jealousy in Iblis triggered him to mislead Adam. So when Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam were in Jannah, he informed them that there has been a memo that was sent out earlier that you will not abide here in Jannah forever. You will be sent to the world where you will reside. Guess what? That was something already mentioned to us. That you're not really made for Jannah. You're made for the earth. You'll be sent as a Khalifa on earth. So do you want to stay in Jannah for a long time? Do you wish to be a permanent resident of Jannah? If the answer is yes, then I have a trick for you. I can teach you a strategy. Basically, if you eat from the forbidden tree, you can get a license to live here forever. And once you do that, you can become immortal. And subhanAllah, it's human weakness that each one of us desires to live a long life. None of us wish to die, right? So Adam alayhi salam gave in to his temptation and ate from the tree. And this resulted in Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam to become exposed to each other. And they were expelled from Jannah and transferred to dunya. However, what was the reaction of both? 
Iblis became more arrogant after the sinful activity. However, Adam السلام, and Hawa السلام, repented and they accepted the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to live with their progeny till it was destined for them to live. So if any one of us comes with a rationale that how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished Adam by sending him to dunya when it was already destined for Adam to go to dunya. How is Adam held accountable for this? And the answer to that is that there are certain things that are part of divine decree. Meaning it's part of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is al-alim. The reason why certain situations happen and certain circumstances takes place, it is for our knowledge. So that the knowledge, the haq is established upon us, the hujjah is established upon us, that this was the situation that came. This was the course of action that we took. And that's how we ended up in this manner. So it's basically to establish a hujjah for us. If all this wouldn't happen and people are just sent to Jannah and Nar just like that, then any one of us can question Allah, the Ya Allah, what did I do to deserve Jahannam? I didn't do anything wrong, right? So in order to establish this hujjah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes all of us through this chapter called life so that the hujjah is established upon us. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows due to his ultimate knowledge that who amongst us will go to Jannah and who will not. So another question often that comes us to our mind is, whose fault was it? Meaning the, the expulsion from Jannah and going to earth, whose fault was it? Now, when it comes to the story of Adam and Eve, we find that according to the Judeo-Christian narrative found in Genesis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited both of them from eating the fruits of the forbidden tree. So Iblis, in the form of a snake, in a form of a serpent, seduced Eve to eat from it, and Eve in turn seduced Adam to eat from it. So when Allah rebuked Adam for what he did, Adam put all the blame on Eve. And that's the reason why they claim that all women suffer due to menstruation, pregnancy, and childbirth as a punishment and consequence of original sin. And subhanAllah, the Quran, contrary to the Bible, places equal blame on both Adam and Eve for their mistake. Nowhere in the Quran can we find even the slightest hint that Eve tempted Adam to eat from the tree or even the fact that she had eaten before him. SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that believers, men and women, are protectors of one and another. They enjoin what is just and forbid what is evil. So men and women, they are equal partners in terms of doing good deeds. So when it comes to hasanat, we should take care of each other, entice each other to perform good deeds, encourage each other so that together we can be partners in Jannatul Firdaus. So phase one was the time when they lived in Jannah. How long was it? We don't know. Was it the Jannah that people are gonna enter after the day of resurrection? We don't know, because some say it was like a temporary Jannah where they were sent. But regardless of the fact, they lived in Jannah for some time. When they made this mistake, then phase two was their life on earth. So the question is, how long were they in Jannah? And how long were they on the earth? And it's mentioned in a narration that Adam السلام, spent 60 years in Jannah and then he wept for 60 years for his loss of Jannah. And then he wept for 70 years when his son Habil was killed. So we can see the humility of Adam alayhi salam that 
he literally wept for equal amount of years as the amount of years he spent joyfully in Jannah. And that is a sign of a humble slave. So when it comes to the progeny of Adam alayhi salam, who are they? Let us introduce ourselves to them. The progeny that's mentioned to us is, subhanAllah, Habil, Habil, and Sheet alayhi salam. So basically, when Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam came to the earth, the earth was an empty land. There were no humans. Probably there were dinosaurs, but there were no humans. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with the set of twins. The twins were Qabil and his sister. That was the first pair of twins they had. Later, they gave birth to a second set of twins, Habil and his sister. And it's mentioned that Qabil tilled the land, whereas Habil raised the cattle. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Adam alayhi salam that he should marry each son to the twin sister of the other. So Adam alayhi salam instructed his children according to the command of Allah that Qabil is going to marry the sister of Habil and Habil is going to marry the sister of Qabil. But Qabil was displeased with his partner because Ab Habil's twin sister was not as beautiful as his own sister. So he became jealous and he refused to accept his father's request because he felt attracted to his own twin sister. Now, this was a test for Adam alayhi salam. He was in a dilemma because he wanted peace and harmony in his family. So he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded that each son should offer a sacrifice and whoever sacrifice was accepted would be on the side of haq. So uh, Habil, Abel, as is mentioned in, in the Bible, Habil offered his best camel while Cain, Qabil, offered his worst grain. So Qabil's sacrifice was not accepted by Allah because of his disobedience to his father and his insincerity in giving and offering. And this, subhanAllah, resulted in a sibling rivalry. So imagine the trial that Adam alayhi salam had to go through. Yes, when Adam alayhi salam came to this world, there was no shirk, there was no idol worship that was going on, but he had different tests, subhanAllah. So he had to go through this family conflicts and family dynamics that was a trial and tribulation for him. So this incident enraged Qabil a lot. That first off, I cannot even marry the person I like. And then my offering isn't even accepted by Allah. My sacrifice to Allah is rejected. Whereas Habil's sacrifice is accepted. So he became so enraged that he threatened Habil that he's going to kill him. And Subhanallah, Habil was a very righteous man. Habil was a very pious person. So he counseled his brother that do not do this. And if you do this, you're going to take my sin upon you. And if you come to kill me, I'm not going to defend myself. So make sure whatever you do, you will be accountable for your sins. So Habil was literally a person of Ihsan. He counseled his brother with love, compassion, but Habil didn't pay heed. He ignored his brother's advice and he threw a stone at him and killed him. And subhanAllah, this was the first murder committed on earth. So of course, this was a very painful moment for Adam alayhi salam to lose one of their children. And that too, not because of natural death, but because one of his sons killed another son. So definitely, it must be devastating for both of them, Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam. So they cried for years, as we mentioned before, that Adam alayhi salam literally cried for 70 years on the loss of Habib. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him another son by the name of Sheet alayhi salam, who became his successor, who became a prophet, and he is the one who taught people about acts of worship, and he came as a mode of guidance for others. There is a narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam where he said, Allah sent down 104 sons, of which 50 were sent down to Sheet alayhi salam. So, subhanAllah, this was a mode of happiness and honor for Adam alayhi salam to have a prophet uh, amongst his children. Now, when Adam alayhi salam died, who's going to perform his funeral? Since there's not much population. So it's mentioned that the angels descended on the earth with his shroud. And they placed him in his grave and prayed over him. And said, O children of Adam, this is your way of burial from now on. And subhanAllah, that's what we learn our burial rites from. Every prophet taught the other prophet. And subhanAllah, the angels taught the people at the time of Adam alayhi salam. So there's, of course, much to learn from this story. But just a wisdom um, I wanted to share. Just let's pause over here for a while and give the story a thought. SubhanAllah, if we ask ourselves that who is the one? If we ask ourselves that if Adam alayhi salam was the first human being on earth, then what about evolution? What about the concept of evolution that humans came through apes? So the classic question, what did humans actually evolve from? Is it Adam or is it apes? And subhanAllah, that's a question that disturbs the minds of our youth many a times, subhanAllah, because people tend to attribute sometimes to the fact that our creation actually came from apes. And many times Muslims attribute it to the story of Israelites who, who are transformed into apes because um, they violated the Sabbath. So they think that perhaps we are their progeny. We came from them, the ones who were transformed into apes. So how much reality is there to this story? The fact of the matter is that those people who stayed, who trans, who were transformed as apes amongst the Israelites, they stayed in that state for three days and then they died. SubhanAllah. So the current generation that we have, they are definitely not to the progeny of those apes, subhanAllah. What's the proof of it? What's the proof that we came from Adam alayhi salam and Hawa? It's um, mentioned in an article uh, that was published in the Times magazine on, you know, in the year 1995. It was mentioned about a scientific study of white chromosomes in a mixed race group. So... One of the professors, Dr. Michael, a geneticist from the University of Arizona, was able to establish that all men do have a common ancestor of African origin who lived less than 200,000 years ago. And this article opposed the theory that mankind evolved from apes, subhanAllah. So this article established that we do have a common ancestor, all of us have a common ancestor. And who is it? It's Adam alayhi salam and her mother Hawa alayhi salam. So that was just a little bit about our father Adam and our mother Hawa. And it's important for us to be acquainted with our parents. So that's why, subhanAllah, we want to take some time with that. So last but not least, as we wrap up this surah, Ayah number 75 to 88, last passage for today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us from this story that when Iblis drifted Adam alayhi salam from Jannah away, he made dua to Allah. What dua was it? He basically asked Allah to give him respite till the day of judgment so that he can mislead mankind from Jannah. And subhanAllah, his dua 
was accepted. His dua was granted to him. And he said, that's what I'm going to do, except the mukhlasin. I will not be able to deviate them. Except your loyal servants, I'm not going to be able to drift them away. And the fact of the matter is that this is a promise that Iblis is living with. So he will try his best to deviate us away from the path of Allah, from the path of Quran. So anytime when we get these whispers from shaitan, then we should uh, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should seek refuge in him so that we can enter our final abode which is Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the whispers of shaitan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to follow the legacy of our prophets. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to live and die in a state that Allah is pleased with us. So some of the action points that we learned from Surah Saad is our firm conviction upon Tawheed and belief in the hereafter. So with that said, we will conclude our session for today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka wa natubu layk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi l-akhirati hasana wa qina adhaba al-nar. Allahumma anis wahshadi fi qabri. Allahumma arhamni bil Qur'an al-azim. Waj'al hu li imaman wa nuran wa hudan wa rahma. اللهم ذكرني منه ما نسيت وعلمني منه ما جهلت ورزقني تلاوته آناء الليل وآناء النهار وجعله لي حجة يا رب العالمين آمين سمامين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته